I'm Sarah Kensier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, available for pre-order now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, a film the Kremlin doesn't want you to see, so be sure to see it. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. Welcome to our special spring series, Gaslit Nation Presents, Rising Up from the Ashes, Cassandra's and other experts on rebuilding democracy. Our bonus episodes, available to Patreon subscribers at the truth teller level and higher, feature our esteemed guests taking the Gaslit Nation self-care Q&A. So for fun ideas, sign up to hear that. Joining at this level also gives you access to hundreds of bonus episodes on topics in the news today. We'll be back with our regular episodes in July. If you're signed up anytime between now and then at the Democracy Defender level or higher on Patreon, you'll get special access to watch a live taping of Gaslit Nation over the summer. More details to come. This interview is recorded at the end of December 2021. We are joined by two very exciting guests, Jessica and Imani, from the Boom Lawyered podcast. So this is a podcast off, (laughs) Um, kind of like a dance off for your ears. All right, so uh, we're going to introduce them, even though they don't need any introduction. Uh, Jessica mason Piclo is a senior vice president executive editor of Rewired News. Jessica has over a decade of experience as a former litigator and taught law for four years before transitioning to journalism. She was part of the SCOTUS blog symposium on abortion rights following Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstead and won the Excellence in Online Journalism Award in 2018 from the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. She has participated in numerous panels, including at NYU Law School, University of Arkansas, University of Colorado, University of Utah, among others. Boom Lawyered won Podcast of the Year in 2017 from the Population Institute. Wow, we're jealous now. (laughs) Um, Imani Gandhi is Senior Editor of Law and Policy for Rewire News Group, where she covers law and courts and co-hosts the RNG podcast, Boom Lawyered. Imani also began and continues to write the Angry Black Lady Chronicles. Imani is a recovering attorney turned award-winning journalist and political blogger. Previously, Imani founded Angry Black Lady Chronicles, winner of the 2010 Black Weblog Award for Blog to Watch and the 2012 Black Weblog Award for Best Political Blog. She received her JD from the University of Virginia School of Law in 2001, where she was a Hardy Cross Dillard Scholar and an editorial board member of the University of Virginia Law Review. She has presented at several conferences and panels, including the 2013 Abortion Care Network as a keynote speaker the 2014 Baffler Conference, the 2016 YBCA 100 Summit. Okay, Imani, there's too many honors here. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to read them all. Wait, I want to get one in. The the 2018 South by Southwest panel, if Roe were to go, because I need to point out that both of the guests we have today have been warning of this crisis of the repeal of Roe versus Wade for as long as I have followed them on Twitter. So I'm going to be stressing that point because I'm I am angry myself that people didn't listen. But Andrea, go on. Okay, so we're going to just get to it. You two are known as Cassandras, who kept warning everybody, pointing out the obvious, that the mainstream media, too many on the left and the right and the middle, refused to see that obviously the human rights of abortion were at stake uh, and that we were headed towards rising autocracy. Uh, You have been very clear about that. And yet people didn't listen. We, you know, and so we wanted to ask you, like, how did you two come together to, you know, start your podcast, get your story out, and, and what sustains you both in the work that you do? We met on Twitter about a decade ago, actually. I was still doing private practice. I was working at a private firm doing corporate nonsense work. And Jess was a professor at the time in healthcare. And then we were both sort of just on Twitter lamenting our misfortune and our careers and wondering why we were doing what we were doing and what we could do that would be better. And at the time, she was in the middle of writing a book. And I remember being like, wow, she's writing a book about abortion rights. That's super cool. And at the time, I was doing this sort of 
crowdsourced database of anti-choice legislation just in my apartment because I felt like that that was lacking in the media landscape. And we came together and Twitter and complained uh-huh. and commiserated, ended up getting hired at, at then what at the place we work at now, which was then called RH Reality Check. And, you know, started we didn't work together at first. That took a few years. We started working together right around, I say, 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. Podcast started 2017. And here we are. Four years later, looking down the barrel of no Roe versus Wade, and we told everybody so long mm-hmm. ago. It's amazing because in so many ways, Amani and I's origin story is really tied up into this whole fight. You know, she said that we met on Twitter about 10 years ago, which is true. Amani and I met in the wake of the Tea Party Revolution, which is really what precipitated the onslaught of anti-abortion regulations at the state, coinciding with electoral and political gerrymandering mandering that just snowballed to the moment that we find ourselves in here. And Imani and I were really in at that moment sort of looking at the political fallout from the 2010 midterm election, seeing what was on the legislative landscape as a result of it and, you know, using our sort of combined legal skills to say, whoa, this looks bad, folks, real bad. Yikes. Okay, so I just want to ask you, we're hearing a lot about the possibility of, of losing Roe, mm-hmm. we've essentially, where are we with that currently? And why is it such a big deal to lose abortion rights in America? I'm just going to come out and say one thing real quick, and then I'm going to throw this to Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the problem is, I think, is that people don't know what Roe says. They don't understand what the case says. And so because that is true, Jess and I did this amazing podcast called We'll Hear Arguments, where we went through the oral arguments in Roe versus Wade. It's a five-episode series, I think with a six-wrap-up uh, episode, where we go through the arguments and we explain what the case is about, what the, uh, what the attorneys on either side were arguing, and what the critical issues are. Because what we're hearing now is people saying things like, well, you know, yeah, the Supreme Court might uphold this Mississippi 15-week ban, but I don't think they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade. And if there's one thing your listeners take away from this conversation, it is this. It is absolutely impossible for the Supreme Court to uphold Mississippi's 15-week ban without overturning Roe versus Wade, right? Because Roe says that pregnant people have the absolute right to get an abortion up to the point of fetal viability, up to the point where the fetus is able to survive outside the womb. Medical consensus is that's about 23 to 24 weeks. 15 weeks is not 23 to 24 weeks. Everyone in this case, the Mississippi case, agreed that this was a pre-viability ban. So Mississippi is asking for this law to be upheld, and people are saying, well, we can uphold it without overturning Roe. No, you can't, because the Mississippi law is a pre-viability ban. Roe says you can't ban abortion pre-viability. If you're going to uphold the ban, you're going to have to reverse Roe. To really put a finer point on that, I want to talk about who the you is in that in what she's saying so that you can't ban abortion. Roe is a limitation on state power, and it's really important that people understand that. The Constitution sets up the relationship between the government and individuals and the government and the government, right? How the federal government behaves with the states and how the government, states and federal, behave with individuals. And so Roe versus Wade says governments, state governments, federal governments, you cannot go and do something like ban abortion outright before certain points. So it is a limitation on what government actors can do. It is absolutely a recognition of individual autonomy, but it is also a limitation on on state power. And I feel like that's something that gets missed in the conversation around Roe versus Wade is that it's really a block on what the state can impose on people. Because state mandated pregnancy and birth is violent. That's a human rights violation. And if we don't talk about that in the same breath, then we can do, you know, then it's possible for people to have the misunderstanding that Imani just described of like, 15 weeks might not be that bad, and it might not be that destructive to the rule of law and democracy when actually it is very bad and super destructive to the rule of law and democracy. How so? Well, in order to uphold 
any kind of abortion restriction that we are in the universe that we are in, the court would absolutely necessarily have to expand the power of governments to reach into individual lives. So that in order to do that, they have to very explicitly say that they're doing that. And if they don't, then we know that the fix is in. And I would just look to Texas, right? So one of your first questions here was, you know, what does this mean? What does what does a row world, post row world mean? In Texas right now, as of the time that we are having this conversation, we are 100 days into SB 8 being in effect. That is a bill that bans nearly all abortion in the state and empowers private citizens to act as bounty hunters to enforce this mechanism. It took it out of the hands of the state and empowered private citizens. This doesn't stop with abortion. This will go to voting rights. This will go to trans rights. This will go to marriage equality. The Texas lawmakers have all, Republicans have already said, do we really have to recognize marriage equality? So it's anti-democratic in that if you can make the argument that you can roll back rights in one area, the government can make that in others. And we're seeing that. And we know that because it's all tied up in the same line of case law. And part of the real issue is, you know, there are certain justices who want to say things like, well, shouldn't we permit the states to have an interest in what these rights are? But we don't allow states to outline the boundaries of fundamental rights. Right. That's the whole point of James Madison and the Federalist Papers. That's why this country was founded, right? We don't allow for majority rule in that way because there are certain minority groups, right? These discrete and insular minorities Mm -hmm. that don't have the political power. They're not able to sort of grow the political power in order to speak for themselves in the political marketplace, right? And so what we're starting to see and what what you'll hear people like Amy Coney Barrett and other sort of quote unquote pro-life feminists say is, well, look at how many women there are in the workplace. Look at how many women there are in schools. Obviously, you know, we've got equality now. So there's no reason why a woman can't take a break from her career for 10 months and gestate a baby and then just give it up for adoption. This isn't a problem. You know, we're starting to see these these claims that we are in a different place now. There's more equality now. Women have more choices now. And therefore, we should be able to take away this, this main choice, this main process, this main piece of healthcare that has allowed women to flourish, that has allowed pregnant people to decide when to have families, whether to have families, and to essentially live their economic lives the way they want to. It's going to be very, very, very irritating to hear people try to couch the banning of abortion as a feminist issue, as a social good, as a socially justice forward issue, right? I mean, just the other day was pointing out to me that she saw someone use the term prenatal justice, mm-hmm. right? We're going to start hearing anti-choicers talking about prenatal justice as a way to push back on reproductive justice as a framework, right? Because when you're talking about prenatal justice, that necessarily takes the pregnant person out of the equation and focuses solely on the rights of this quote-unquote unborn child. And make no mistake, the rights that that they, the big they, anti-choicers, anti-choice lawmakers, Republicans, conservative Christian evangelicals, they want fertilized eggs to have ostensibly the same rights that you and I are supposed to have, but we don't even have all of the constitutional rights that we're supposed to have. So what's going to happen is fertilized eggs are going to have more constitutional rights than particularly black and brown women and low-income women. Can you talk about, you know, like I live in Missouri where this battle um, has been ongoing and we've had things happen. Like one of our state officials was tracking the menstrual cycles of Mm -hmm. women who'd been to Planned Parenthood to figure out their fertile time, to figure out if maybe they'd, you know, had an abortion. And, you know, we're seeing um, obviously even more extreme laws in places like Texas where there's bounty hunters, but there's a, a surveillance state apparatus. You know, the Republicans will go on and on about, you know, we need the federal government out of our lives. We need the rights to our autonomy and freedom. How is that working out for women? Because I see this as, you know, one that's a reproductive rights issue, but it's a broader just invasion of privacy and just a a dominance, you know, this need for, um, you know, to force us to submit to them. That's what it feels like anyway, living here. 
Absolutely. And I mean, I think it's exactly on the money. And in fact, over at Rewire News Group, we published a, recently a, an editorial package called A Gathering Storm that really looks at the impact on um, all of the other ways that abortion bans impact people who can become pregnant. Because when we ban abortion, it's not just limited to that particular medical decision. It puts our entire civil liberties up for debate. And I would just point p- people to the case of Marlise Munoz in Texas uh, about five or six years ago. This was a woman who was pregnant with a wanted pregnancy and suffered a pulmonary embolism in her kitchen at about 14 weeks pregnancy. So before the pregnancy was was viable, she suffered brain death. She was functionally dead. And the Fort Worth Hospital kept her alive against a do not resuscitate order, against the wishes of her family to gestate the pregnancy because it was potentially viable. And so we we covered this case. We you know over at Rewire News Group, I recently brought it back up in some recent coverage because these are stories that are happening now. So Sarah, your point is exactly right. The surveillance state aspect is a hundred percent correct. You cannot enforce an abortion ban unless you are surveilling people who can who can become pregnant from the moment they are reproductive capable. And those are actual phrases. And they sound so dystopian, but that's where we are. Whew. Wow. Okay. Sarah and I focus on kleptocracy generally, but then to hear how authoritarianism wreaks havoc on the body, mm-hmm. this is just a whole other layer of it that we haven't been in the weeds on in, in some time. So we really appreciate all, all, all these uh, stories and details. But so what can we do? Because Roe versus Wade was passed 50 years ago. Are we looking at a 50-year battle ahead just to get it back, given that we have these young people on the Supreme Court put on by Trump? Um, the three that he added were are fairly young, we have what could possibly be a Republican victory at the midterms in 2022. And and if they come into power, we all know, and if they, they're gerrymandering and their voter suppression laws stay in place, they'll probably stay in power for some time. So what are you seeing in terms of what America will look like over the next 50 years? I mean, you try to warn us all and tell us what's what's coming next. I'll just say real quickly, and then I'm going to throw this to Jess. What's been so frustrating is that it doesn't necessarily have to take 50 years. It doesn't necessarily have to take a generation. But we are stuck with a group of Democrats who refuse to nuke this filibuster. Democrats have a year before midterms. If they pass voting rights legislation, if they nuke the filibuster, pass voting rights legislation, that frees up you know, Democratic voters to actually just go and vote, just to do the thing that we're constitutionally allowed, permitted, you know, authorized to do, which is go and vote. The reason why we're not able to do that is, as you said, because of the gerrymandering, the voter suppression, and the fact that Republicans know that their policies aren't widely popular. Mm -hmm. And that includes abortion, right? I mean, the, the majority of people do not want to see Roe versus Wade overturned. So they are ruling from the minority, even now with Democrats holding the Senate and the White House and the House of Representatives. Representatives, are Democrats in control? No, they're not. And so what's frustrating is that if Democrats, and I understand anyone who's listening to this, a lot of people are going to say, but mansion and cinema, mansion and cinema. The problem is, is people who aren't dialed into politics the way we are, the people who aren't extremely online are not going to want to hear, well, mansion and cinema are the reason why Democrats couldn't get X, Y, and Z done. All they're going to see is Democrats held all three. They held the House, they held the, they held the Senate, and they held the White House, and they didn't get shit done. Right. Mm-hmm. So if Democrats could get things done and they could not only save democracy, but to the extent that so many of them are self-interested, they can save their own jobs. And yes. that's part of what I don't understand. Like the corruption must. And this is your y'all's specialty. The corruption must run irrevocably deep. If we cannot get someone like Kirsten Cinema to want to get reelected. Right? Like, yeah. who is paying her that much money that she doesn't even give a shit if she's primary? Or that she lives in a democracy anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely with you. I don't understand it. We've been talking about it all year. Obviously, we've been talking about it on Twitter and elsewhere, too. Like, why not get rid of the filibuster, not just for the moral integrity of the country, not just for the legal integrity of the country, but for the pure self-interest of the party? And this is a party that is very self-interested most of the time. But they are going to get themselves knocked right out of a job and in the process... You 
you know, take down our court system, our freedom of speech, our reproductive rights, uh, you know, laws that have been on the books uh, for decades that were considered settled law, you know, in a similar way uh, to Roe versus Wade that people kept saying, oh, it's impossible for them to get it done. It's all on the verge and abolishing the filibuster would go such a long way uh, to trying, you know, to enshrining Um, you know, those legal dictates. I mean, obviously the Republicans will keep pushing and pushing and pushing anyway, but Mm -hmm. still it's like they're not even trying. Like, do you get the impression they're trying or is it just me that's that's reached this level of of deep frustration? It's so frustrating because I don't understand it. If I understood it, that Mm -hmm. would be one thing, but I cannot understand it unless it's just really as House of Cards, you know, basic bitch as everyone's getting paid off and they don't care. You know what I mean? Like if we're living in House of Cards, then fine. But I wish someone would tell me because I'm very confused. Is there someone who will pay more? Because this is going to wreak havoc on so many people's lives. Like, for example, overturning Roe versus Wade, like that's not going to make anyone's life easier. I mean, obviously the main person is not going to make their life easier is the pregnant person, but like generally for society, it's going to be chaos, vigilante violence, you know, endless court cases, the declining, you know, popularity and, and incredible frustration with both parties. And, you know, and this is why Andrea and I are often warning of autocracy because we see both parties behaving as if they're not trying to win people over, as if they're not trying, you know, worried about winning elections. It's much more about the mechanisms of who gets to vote and who counts the votes and what happens with the votes when they reach the legislature. But it all adds up to a pretty grim picture. Um, sorry, I like uh, interrupted your own answers, but you know, feel free to, to no, weigh in. It- <laughs> I know. I think that's all true. And I also, you know, think that it's like with that frustration of folks being like, oh, my God, how did we get here where this came out of nowhere? And I remember Josh Hawley as Missouri's attorney general being like, no, this didn't come out of nowhere. Like you do not get Josh Hawley at the Beckett Fund pressing challenges to the birth control benefit in the Affordable Care Act, which he did, and then get elected to the U.S. Senate and also supporting an insurrection and not think that those things aren't all tied up in the same breath. You know, one of the things that I have been talking about a lot is that we are in a massive backlash cycle. And y'all know, you all are very familiar with backlash cycles in terms of dealing with autocracy and all of that stuff. But we are in a backlash cycle because people can become pregnant minority populations, marginalized folks have finally started to reach some economic power in this country. And the demographics are not on the side of white evangelicals and they know it. And so this is their power grab. And we are absolutely seeing it. And so, you know, Mark Elias is out there saying we've got one or two elections maybe at the most. And I think that some of this, how did we get here, comes from the fact that there were a lot of Democrats in power who looked at the Josh Hollies when they were coming up in, in their careers and said, we don't need to take that guy seriously because he's part of the fringe, not understanding that the fringe was always the mainstream. It really always was. Like, I grew up with Birchers in my family. If we don't think that the John Birch Society isn't still around doing this crap today, I don't know. Yeah, and on that note, I mean, it's one thing to be uh, in denial, you know, in 2016, thinking, oh, Trump can't win. Yeah. Or in denial about what the Tea Party was really going for, even after Citizens United. I mean, I personally don't understand the denial, but I sort of see it. Right. At this point, five years later, we've had a plague. Uh, a coup, two impeachments, yeah. a multitude of criminal offenses, like, you know, half of Trump's campaign arrested, all these rights rescinded, incredible violations on human rights, civil rights. Like, it's all in our faces. And yet, Imani, you in particular, I've seen you just looking at, you know, the Josh Marshalls and, and hear jeets of the world that are like, oh my God, Roe versus Wade may be overturned. Like, they're hearing it for the first time. And it's like, what is wrong with these men? But more importantly, like, what is the effect on our society and our politics that all these men are wrong just so consistently or clueless? I love this question. It's, yeah, I mean, I'm actually writing a piece about this because, you know, the one thing we don't have time for is to just get everyone up to speed, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't have time to hold people like, you know, Chris Hayes' hand as he talks about, <laughs> well, I think in the post row world, more state legislatures are going to introduce abortion ban. Jesus Christ! <laughs> are you kidding me? Your, your wife wrote a book on abortion politics. Like, it is inexcusable. And it's partly this sort of 
this sleepy eyed, what? What's happening? I don't know what's happening. And at the same time, an unwillingness to recognize that there are women who have more expertise than they do. Mm-hmm. And an unwillingness to seed the to seed the mic, to hand the mic. Chris, have Renee Bracy Sherman, have Lori Bertram Roberts, have Marsha Jones of the Afia Center in Texas. Have these these people are all showing up on Black Channel tonight, right? They're all on yep. BCN. They're all being interviewed by black journalists. But these white dudes are just, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, Ellie Mistal is holding it down, but he's literally the only person that they call. And God bless him. I mean, he always cites women. But there are women who have been, we, Jess and I have been doing this for a decade, right? And this is not some sort of, oh, put me and Jess on TV. It's all, it's, uh, it's a whole swath of people, of grassroots activists. It's not even Jess and I that people need to hear from. They need to hear from black organizers in the South, the people who 10 years ago, when the personhood moved, Movement was trying to pass a ballot initiative in Mississippi saying, hey, life begins at conception and fertilize eggs are people. Black women were like, no, we're not going to do this and stopped it. Right. They stopped it. What they weren't able to stop was the voter ID law. Why? Because mainstream repro rights organizers swooped in down south and didn't listen to them when these black women were saying the voting rights ballot initiative is tied up to the personhood ballot initiative. We need to address them together. This is a decade ago. And here we are still now, a decade later, saying we need to address voting rights before we can even protect abortion rights. How can we protect abortion rights if we're not allowed to vote? How are we still having this conversation a decade later? Yeah, no, it's incredibly frustration. And I think there's, you know, there's obviously racial bias. There's geographic bias, which is one of the most frustrating things about this, because so much of the voting rights activism, of reproductive rights activism comes out of the South, out of necessity, because you're stuck with these gerrymandered legislatures. But then there are these pundits, you know, almost always white men from very expensive coastal cities who think, you know, this is like the will of the people. Like, this is what people in Missouri want. This is what people in, you know, Georgia or Louisiana or whatever want. And of course, there are people who want that. Of course, there are people who want uh, Roe versus Wade rescinded and so forth. But it is, I agree with you, it is absolutely remarkable that they leave these voices out. And I think they do it. I, I've said this about kleptocracy and corruption, you know, they they feign shock to dodge accountability. If they're able to say, oh, no one could see this coming, then there's no responsibility for failing to stand up uh, to these vigilante movements and these right-wing extremist movements. Um, that's absolutely maddening. You know, on that note, I'm seeing some of these uh, pundits and politician types being like, oh, this will actually be good for the Democrats if Roe versus Wade gets overturned in, in June 2022, right before the midterms, because the backlash will help. Now, what do you think of this argument? <laughs> what backlash? What, the, the 55% Since of white when? women that vote for GOP? I mean, exactly. I'm going to let the, the resident white lady, because Jess is always like, she's always leveraging her white ladiness to call bullshit on white ladies, because that's just a, that is a nonsense argument. I mean, yeah, I I don't know what to say to people who think that taking away fundamental rights is a political win in any fucking universe. In any universe, like truly. And there's no backlash. There is no backlash. We do not live in cancel culture. We do not live in accountability on these things. If we did, we would not be having this conversation now. If there was real accountability, if there's real concern about the lives of people who can become pregnant, we would understand that this is not political football, right? Like one of the things that will happen if and when the Republicans take hold of the executive and legislative branches of government is they will pass a nationwide abortion ban. That will be a priority. They don't have any real agenda, but they know they can do that. So it doesn't matter if you live in New York or California right now. Reversing Roe isn't, you know, doesn't mean you're safe in a blue state, you know? So the idea that, like, there's political backlash, no. There's not. There has yet to be accountability on any of that. People who think that, like, it's going to create mass mobilization and do what? Nobody can vote in the places where they need to vote. Like, so they're going to what go on the street. Like, if people organized in, like, a general strike and really shut this country down, wow. That would be amazing. Do I see a political will to do that for people who can become pregnant? I don't. I wish I did, but I don't. 
Yeah. No, it's it's very frustrating because so much of the leverage has been taken away from the people, you know, whether in terms of mass protests and then just apathy shown towards it by elected officials, but obviously in terms of voter suppression laws and these new laws in Georgia and Texas, um, you know, so, so much falls in the hands of legislatures. And during Biden's campaign, you know, one of the big things they were floating was expanding the Supreme Court uh, yeah. to make it not this politicized extremist uh, right-wing court. What happened to that plan? And do you think it's possible in this environment for that to go forward? I mean, the Biden Court Commission basically just submitted a book report that was like, we think it would be nice to have some reforms. Doopy 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 doo. Like, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, that's, you know, that's sort of what I was touching on earlier yeah. when I said it doesn't have to take 50 years for the, the, the backlash to the backlash. But it's going to because Democrats don't have the stomach to do what needs to be done. And what's bizarre about it is that Republicans would do it in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. right? And they would do it for terrible reasons. They yeah. would do it to line their own pockets. They would do it to be more corrupt and to be less accountable. What we as, as abortion rights enthusiasts are saying is sack up and do something for the good of the people. Yeah. Right. It's like they're like, oh, well, if we nuke the filibuster now, then what if Republicans, blah, blah, blah. Stop living your life by saying, well, what if Republicans, blah, blah, blah. Because Live your life as if you know Republicans are going to do the absolute worst thing that you can think of and do what you need to do to protect people, to protect the rights of people. If that's what you say you want to do, if that's what you say you are the party of, then you need to show that. And in a more holistic way than, you know, four weeks parent to leave here and, you know, a bill here and a bill there. I mean, yeah, sure. Kamala Harris is doing great thing on black maternal mortality. So is Underwood. The mom and bill is fantastic. But that's one thing. We right. need broad change. And an infrastructure bill is not going to cut it. Like an infrastructure bill where the stuff goes into effect when Trump is elected again in 24, is not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah. So Madison Cawthorn recently on the House floor referred to women as earthen vessels yep. sanctified by almighty God. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You go, girls. Okay, sorry. Um. So <laughs> what, what really <laughs> creeps me out is Madison Cawthorn and this whole religious cage, like, I mean, Aaron Sorkin, I'm, I have to give it to him, he called it correctly when he said this is American Taliban. Uh, what is this whole religion? Like, I don't even want to call it religion because it's, it's just power, right? What is this? <laughs> like, what is this? Like, like when they had Christian it, nationalism, it's Christian nationalism. Right. When they had Amy Coney Barrett uh, going up, uh, being shoved through in the Supreme Court, uh, mm -hmm. reportedly the least qualified person to ever go up for that lifetime position, they kept praising her across Fort Wright Media, saying, look how many children she has. Mm -hmm. She's a mother. She's this earthen vessel of, of God. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like the way they just yeah. pigeonhole women to be baby machines, baby makers. It's the creepiest thing. And that's why you see so many of these men on the front lines of screaming about abortions. Please, so just let loose on this for a while. Oh, can I? I've been gearing up for this. I've been riding this hobby horse all week. So... There is a very real pro-natalist movement afoot right now to soften what will be the political shock for when Roe versus Wade is reversed. So what do I mean by that? Madison Hawthorne is an example is a perfect example of that. And it goes from him, you know, to um, Elon Musk talking about like the need for everybody to be having babies right now to Instagram influencers being like, I don't know about birth control. Those chemicals make me feel kind of weird. It's all tied up in the same vision of this country as a white Christian nation. And folks like Madison Cawthorn are worried that they are losing the demography fight and the ideas fight because they are. Nobody wants to be them. And so everything that is happening right now is absolutely a messaging battle while the legislative and political battle is happening at the same time. So you're going to hear a lot of this. And I mean, you're not even going to only hear it in conservative spaces. You're going to hear it in nominally progressive spaces as well. There's all of this like 
like it's hip to be like the trad wife in certain spaces now. And like that's actually we spent a what's, lot what's of the trad wife, the traditional wife, like uh, traditional like, wife, like yes, that right. idea of like, you know, feminine domesticity, which came as a result of a backlash cycle to economic gains post World War Two. Right. That's where the current sort of Amy Coney Barrett visions of American whiteness and femininity comes down from. And so we're seeing that. And that is all rhetoric. That is all propaganda designed to get to folks who, you know, are white women and don't think about these things on the regular and are persuadable. I have a friend who thinks it's hot that he works and his wife stays home and takes care of the kids. Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) He's like, he's like turned on by that. Meanwhile, my husband, who's a a blazing feminist is like, get a job. <laughs> He's like, bring in money. No. <laughs> you know, so I just, it's, it's, those are such great flags for people to see because it's like, you would not at all think that like, you know, popping on Instagram and seeing, you know, a lot of posts about like, what's this, you know? And I'm not like saying hormonal birth control is like the bee's knees. There's obviously a long history and problems with what that, but The attacks on the efficacy of birth control happening at the same time we're rolling back abortion rights, at the same time women are kicked out of the economy thanks to COVID. I'm just saying these things aren't coincidences, folks. To, you know, really scare the the crap out of you, you have to remember that there has been rhetoric about how women shouldn't even be voting. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of rhetoric around that. Specifically in white spaces, too. Definitely in white spaces. Right. So if you take the trad wife you know, regime to its natural conclusion. We're talking about the rolling back of voting rights for women, period. And part of the problem is, is, you know, Jess and I have been beating this drum for a decade and people kept saying, oh, Roe is safe. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And now it's not safe. Now we've been proven right. So now what I need people to do is to not pat us on the head as we go through the next several months, the next year, while Jess and I are explaining to you what the fuck it is is coming down the pike, right? Because Mm -hmm. we know what it is. We've been proven right. And I don't want to have to handhold the Josh Marshalls and the Chris Hayes and the well-meaning white dudes, the well-meaning left of center white dudes who have a lot of Republican friends who don't seem that bad. I just, I don't have time for it. We don't, women and pregnant people don't have time for it. And it's long past time that men stopped with this sort of sleepy eye, hey bro, what's going on sort of outlook and get it the fuck together. One thing that we've seen over and over again is a lot of the sex scandals are really, and including the really horrific ones, keep popping up again and again on the Republican Party side. There's even a study that came out a couple years ago saying how people in so-called red states are the largest consumers of porn. There's nothing wrong with consuming porn, of course, but I'm just saying there's this weird... And if you look at, like, the Trump women, right, that surround Trump, uh, all Barbies, making him look, like, so virile and, like, he's such a god among women. And that's all done intentionally. Like, Mussolini had that to mm-hmm. show I'm so masculine, I'm a man among men. And, yep. and what really freaks me out about this earthen vessel thing, this bringing back the traditional housewife, how hot is that to have women subservient to men, it's all kink. It's all kink. Yes, it has a power play dynamic, as you mentioned, like pushing back against declining power and demographics. But at the end of the day, the Republican Party is the party, in my opinion, of pedophiles, because a lot of these cases are coming up on their side, of horrific sex scandals and just dehumanizing women as as objects, objectifying women. I mean, look at Roger Ailes and Fox News. Uh, So... I just hate this idea that they're forcing their kink on us when when it's repulsive. And what's also worrisome for me as a Black woman is that once you start making white women feel like they need to be subservient to white men, they're going to feel the need to lord their power over other people. And then we mm-hmm. are going to lose whatever minimal gains we've yeah. made when it comes to intersectional feminism, right? Because white women are going to feel the need to lord their power over someone. So that means they're going to lord their power over black and brown women, yeah. right? When we talk about earth and vessels from God, Madison Cawthorn is not talking about me. No. Right. He's not talking about, you know, Latinx immigrants or indigenous women. Right. He's talking about white women and he's not even really talking about low income white women, but they'll do. Right. Like Lori Bertram Roberts, who's a who, smart statistic on Twitter, who everyone should follow. She always says stuff like, oh, they just want Becky in the trailer park to keep having babies because not only are they are they wor- not only do they want these earth and godly vessels, they just want more white people just generally. 
this replacement theory it's they're talking about. They're, theory. They're, yep. they're serious about that and they are concerned. So, you know, to the extent that I see white women being sort of taken in by this white supremacy, by this idea that if the white dude just let them in the room, then it'll be fine. We just have to get in the room and then it'll be fine. Yeah. And and we we don't even have to hypothesize around that. I mean, some of the most violent and awful enforcers in the Jim Crow time of this country in particular were white women in their own households and especially during periods of chattel slavery. So Amani's point is absolutely true. Like, you know, the earthen vessel conversation is absolutely about white women having more babies as ordained by God in their natural role. And look, I'm 47. It was not that long ago that I would not have been able to open a credit card in my own name. And I guarantee you that Madison Cawthorn is fine with that, that all of the, you know, that that is, it's not just trying to get back to like, oh, you know, women can't control their bodies. It's undoing New Deal gains that literally allowed women and people who are marginalized in this society to just exist free from random violence, if possible, even, right? Like, the bounty provision of the Texas abortion ban isn't even new. We're really going back to treating everybody as property if they're not white dudes. It's the Fugitive Slave Act for (laughs) pregnant people. You know? Exactly right. The only thing I could think that sort of did change, and much more for the worse, from, say, you know, the 70s when Roe versus Wade passed and Phyllis Schlafly was, Mm -hmm. you know, raging her campaign, because she's very much in the tradition you're describing, is that it is incredibly expensive now uh, to have kids. You know, like, I have two kids. I have a a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. And having them just at that time when they were born was very expensive. It is, it, it looks cheap now compared to what women or, you know, or people who are pregnant now are going through, what families are going through, trying to raise their babies. So part of my question is like, okay, so you want to ban abortion. You very likely want to ban birth control. You mm-hmm. want to monitor, uh, you know, what women and girls are doing. You want to monitor um, their sex lives and, you know, make it so it's it's easier for them, you know, harder for them to prevent um, becoming pregnant pregnant if they don't want to. And then what? And then you deliver this baby into a world where you go into debt just for having the child itself, the hospital bills, and then of course the cost of raising it, the lack of uh, daycare, you know, because you're going to have to go back to work. The trad wife dream is not really affordable for the vast majority of America. Like how how do they think this is going to play out? The church is going to do all that, Sarah. The church is going to do all that. So, I mean, like the Supreme Court this week heard a case that isn't even about abortion. It's about school funding. And it is all about the pipeline of getting taxpayer dollars into the church. This is the grift. This is the grift. They Because it's not like they're interested in Medicaid for all, right? It's not like anybody's interested in expanding the social safety net. As Imani said, we can't even get anybody on board for four weeks of paid leave in this fucking country. You think we're going to get any kind of like robust uh, social services for folks who are forced to gestate and deliver care, folks think the church, that this is the role for the church. That's the end game for them. Is it a particular church or it's just general Christian churches? Well, they're or is all it- united now, the Catholics and the evangelicals, right? It's like this whole yeah. cross-Christian coalition. Just an extremist strain of every every faith. Yeah, I was raised Catholic. It used to be like the Catholics and the evangelical Lutherans didn't talk to each other, and they're all at the same party now. Same with the Baptists. So truly, it is sort of like white, you know, mostly white evangelical religious spaces, and then the the denomination matters less as much as you're rallying for the Jesus. Yeah. Obviously, the Nazis promoted all of this as well. They said, go have a bunch of Aryan babies, everyone. And there's even an idea that came up under Nazism of, of Nazi officers, I believe, being able to take more than one wife so they can procreate even more. Um, so we've seen this before, and we and they're trying to drag us back. What hope do you see? If you were, like, what... If if you were in charge of the simulation we're all stuck in, like how would you program it? Like what 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 are the avenues of leverage we have? Where can we apply pressure? In any situation, it seems like the darker you are, the more answers you have. And having talked to so many of the organizers in Mississippi who were ignored a decade ago, who had ideas and plans, looking at what Stacey Abrams was able to do in Georgia. 
put money where black women are asking for it and who need it. You know what I mean? That's just, Mm -hmm. it's going to be hard. You know what I mean? We're not, anti-choicers, they played a very long game. They played a very good long game. And quite frankly, our side was mired down in bullshit second wave feminism. And now I think that the majority of people on the repro side are in for repro justice. Certainly there are people who are still hanging on to that rights framework and who are trying to frame repro justice as just another repro rights issue and ignoring all of the just the, it's, it's an umbrella. Right. And a lot of people still don't want to focus on that umbrella because they're still real focused on like white ladies, middle class white ladies. But the bottom line is, is the more that we focus on the most vulnerable people the better off we're all going to be. And these black women in the South, they are poor. They are non-binary. They are socialist. They're everything that we want leaders to be. It's just that no one is listening to them because they don't look the way that they're supposed to look. They don't look the way that someone at MSNBC thinks that a guest should look, and it's frustrating. I'm going through this odd period of optimism where I'm kind of like, yeah, we're kind of fucked, but I'm energized by all of the new people who are being activated on this issue. I'm energized by the number of people who are interested in learning about it. So I don't know, maybe this kumbaya stuff isn't going to last. I'm not sure. Maybe Jess has another answer, but I, I feel like it is a backlash. Shit like this is cyclical. Whether or not I see any change in my lifetime, I certainly think that there is going to be change. And if we yeah. can get Democrats to actually do something in the next year, maybe the change will be sooner than we think. Who knows? And another difference, too, is, um, you know, we have the advances in medication abortion and the ability to self-manage abortion now. So that genie is not going back in the bottle. Um, And that is powerful and radical in ways that is new. And so, you know, when the when and and not without risk, right, in self-managed abortion, the risk there is largely legal versus medical um, and, and all very real. So those are spaces where it's not like, oh, yay, the silver lining is we all get to be abortion outlaws managing our own care. That's not great. But the reality is, is, you know, the care isn't going away and we have a lot of knowledgeable people who are determined and inventive and will be able to get care. It's just going to be rough. And I think folks need to understand how also how empowered um, the uh, anti-choice movement feels right now. So not only will we see lots of really rough laws, but but folks feel entitled to people's space and their bodies and, and their attention in ways that can be scary. Uh, So one thing about authoritarians and wannabe authoritarians is that they're intrusive. They're intrusive. They come after you wherever you are. And so if with the current landscape of the courts and let's say things don't go our way in the next two elections and they are in charge and they're growing their numbers on the courts and, and they ban abortion in their states that they control and then they can come after the blue states because you know they will. You know because they're not going to stop. They're voracious. and so. If should that happen, and I and and in general too, like just where we're headed with this far right activist Supreme Court, do you see this increasingly far right judiciary that we're stuck under? Do you see it leading to a balkanization of the United States, where we're almost like a reverse civil war in the sense where it's the blue states now that are like, all right, we've had enough. We've got a great quality of life here because we tend to be the ones taking care of the most vulnerable. So, do you see sort of the court system potentially heading us on a path? of the state splitting up in some sense or form or um, weakening federalism generally, or, or how could that potentially play out? I think that is a possibility. I the, I hesitate to that as a possibility because after 10 years plus of paying attention to the anti-choice movement, the one thing I know is that they're just not satisfied with anything other than complete victory. And the idea of having blue state oasises where people have more rights in, you know, or access to more care than elsewhere, I just don't see them going for it, frankly. Like, you know, I mean, Imani was right when she said that fetal personhood is their ultimate goal. And, you know, we have examples right now in effect. Like, look at what's going on in Poland right now, right? Total abortion bans. Pregnant people have died. And the response hasn't been to then take a second and say, maybe we should look at liberalizing our abortion laws. No, the response in Poland has been, well, what we need is a registry of people as soon as they know that they're pregnant so we can track those pregnancies to determine if a crime has occurred if there's a pregnancy loss. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I also think that the environment of COVID and the normalization of mass death 
through a plague, um, you know, is contributing to this. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm leading everyone down a dark road, but I worry about that. I worry about this general loss of empathy, especially for vulnerable people and their mm -hmm. health. And that if a uh, pregnant woman is in distress um, or, you know, fighting for basic rights, that that kind of baseline empathy that maybe would have been there, um, you know, four years ago, 10 years ago, what have you, it, it's eroding over time. And the GOP is very savvy about this, you know, and is positioning of themselves as like protectors of what they see as the ultimate vulnerable person, the, you know, unborn person uh, with no regard, no respect uh, for the bodily autonomy, the, the you know, the actual person of, of a, a pregnant individual. Um, yeah, it's a frightening thing. Sorry, that was a, more, yeah. more of a, a comment than a question, uh, as we <laughs> used to say in the hellhole of academia. <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, that was Imani's prenatal justice point, right? Like, they're doing that. Prenatal justice is, I guarantee you, was field tested. They spent time thinking of that phrase. Yeah, because justice, right? I mean, it's, a, it's the same thing that they did in the, like, in the I guess the late 90s, early 2000s with this post-abortive syndrome, right? All of these women who were getting abortions and they were so traumatized. They were busing them in to like South Dakota to give testimony and legislative hearings about whether or not, you know, women should be forced to hear things like you are terminating a whole person, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's they couch themselves in the cloak of social justice, in the cloak of empathy, but really what it is, is they want power. They don't mm -hmm. care about the pregnant person. They, they will lie to the pregnant person to scare the shit out of them because they want to control them. Yeah. So I have a big reveal for this show and our listeners. <laughs> so I happen to be in my fifth month of pregnancy. We oh. are... <laughs> yeah, surprise. Now let's talk about that. No, but we're going to um, be airing the show over maternity leave. And I, don't, and I don't even know what that's going to be like for me mm -hmm. because I was recently told I have a high-risk pregnancy. And the doctor in New York City, where I live, was very matter-of-fact. He's like, here's the situation. And if it be, and he was like, very matter-of-fact. He's like, oh, no, if it comes between mm -hmm. saving you and the baby, obviously we're going to save you. Like, it wasn't like, yeah. <laughs> he, it was like one of the things he was like rattling off in terms of like explaining things to me. And there was like no question about it. And I communicated all that to my husband. And my husband was like, yeah, of course, of course we're saving you. And that's nothing against my unborn child who I feel mm -hmm. like a spiritual connection with because I yeah. just, I'm carrying her around having a great time um and so but but that was just like a given for everybody involved you know like everyone's like yeah <laughs> and, and that's I, not anymore necessarily right exactly and i keep thinking when i'm listening to your conversation i keep thinking if i was stuck in in any of these states yeah. in, the, in like 10 years from now and i was in this situation and especially if i'm a young woman who hasn't had enough experience in my life to know how to protect myself and, and assert myself and and they were like yeah Oh, well, we're, you know what I mean? Like, just my life would be in danger. If you were in Texas right now, your life would be in danger. SB8 on the books means that folks who are in high risk pregnancies don't have the benefit of the full panoply of information because providers are scared to provide that information to them. So I've spoken to doctors who are mater maternal fetal health specialists, and they don't know how to advise high risk pregnancies in Texas right now. Dear God. I might, that my heart just goes out to those women because it's scary enough yeah. to hear that you have a high risk pregnancy and that that you yeah. just have to take every day as it comes and then to be in an, a dystopian environment where you as a living fully fledged human being who has all these dependents in your life and that you're you might get taken out for the sense of some power s struggle essentially. And that's such a key point that you said, you know, the people that already depend on you, because most people who get abortions already have children. So we're talking about, you know, politicians and lawmakers who claim to value life and to, to value family, talking about stripping parents away from their existing children, jailing them for however long, you know, for Brittany Pula, I mean, she doesn't have any kids already, but like, People are being thrown in jail and they have children. Amanda Kimber was thrown into jail. She has children. This is a woman out of Alabama. Alabama already has a personhood law. In Alabama, fertilized eggs are people. So, I mean, we're just, we're already in such a bad place. And I just, I'm finding it really difficult watching people. And I understand the impetus to not want to admit that we're in that bad place, but we are there and we need to figure out a way to all get on board, to all get on the same page and to all start talking about these things in the proper way, even including something as what people see as trivial as talking about pregnant people and not pregnant women. I get still so much pushback when I say it's not just women who need abortions. That's just a fact. It's a scientific fact. 
So when you're talking about this stuff in an inappropriate way or an uninclusive way, that matters, right? Our language matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Absolutely. Uh, Well, okay, so you guys have been fabulous. (laughs) And you are welcome back anytime. And um, I know you've shared a lot already, but do you want to leave our listeners with any resources they can check out in order how to stay engaged on this issue, stay informed on this issue, uh, stand up for this issue, especially heading into the midterms? Well, I will say that Jess writes an amazing newsletter, an amazing weekly newsletter called The Fallout. Um, it's, if you go to rewirenewsgroup.com dot com slash fallout, you can sign up for the newsletter. And it's just every week you're going to want her thoughts in your inbox. Ah. Uh. Thank you, Amani. I was going to say absolutely make sure everybody's following Amani over on Twitter because there's really nobody um, I who I see or in this space at all who connects the dots on all of these issues, who is so consistently just in the mix. And so honestly, Amani is the national expert on um, these issues here you know, so definitely make sure and follow that. You know, we're doing our best over at the Boom Lawyer podcast to really make these issues understandable for folks so that, you know, I- explaining that, look, an abortion ban affects more than just abortion, for example. So really, you know, over at Rewire News Group, we're trying to do that. And then, you know, lots of just other good folks in the space right now at the state level. Now is a time to be dialed into what is happening in your own backyard. <laughs> Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Razum for Ukraine at Razum, R-A-Z-O-M, for Ukraine.org. That's Razum for Ukraine.org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans, already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Oh, and by the way, if you don't hear your name in this list and you've signed up, we're going to say your name starting in July and keep it going for however long you donated. FYI. <laughs> so we want to thank Eric Coffin, Jess Sauer, Chick Quinn, Lily Wachowski, Megan McNerney, Sean Rubin, Todd S. Perlstein, Pat, Kenny Maine, John Schoenthaler, Frank Jaquette, Ellen McGurt, Joel Ferron, Larry Gasson, Erica Moore, Karen A. Deal, Nico Phillips, Brian E. Castor, Andrea or Andrea Scalzo, Tatiana Bursch, Karen Heisler, Jordan Sanders, Ann Bertino, Chris Bravo, T.R. Dunstan, John Millett, David East, Stu, Shannon Nacy, Ida, Chris Fellow, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Halcombe, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hatrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Yvonne Q, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, K. 
Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, <laughs> Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, <laughs> Crimer, no criming, Jason Benke, Joe Darcy, Ann Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Joel Newman, Trigve, Christine M. D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Brian to Juden, Maureen Murphy, Michelle Dash, Abby Road, Jans Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, Alabama, ZW, Lisa Laflame, Jason Bainbridge, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, Jennifer Ann Luter, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, Piet Itzma, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Kim Mellon, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Eric Kaplan, Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. <laughs>